I intend to do some of the descriptions of what leadership is all about, um, which you already know, but we just want to emphasize on this issue. Leadership is the ability to inspire others towards a common vision, goal, and objectives. Those qualities and actions that create a sense of belonging and buy-in in others while encouraging and rewarding initiative and innovation. That is leadership. And this is what Africa requires. And we're going to look at what strategy is because just being a leader without having a strategy is failure. What is a strategy? A strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term or overall aim of any organization, be it government, military, NGO, or otherwise. And this strategy should have a plan because if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. So what is strategic planning? Strategic planning, therefore, is the translation of strategy and its vision, objectives, and outcomes into a roadmap of actions with defined responsibilities, who is going to do what, and accountabilities, monitoring and evaluating what's going on. Therefore, strategic leadership is a practice in which senior leaders, executives of organizations, apply different management styles to develop a vision for their organization that enables it to adapt, to remain competitive in a changing social, economic, and technological climate, because it's pointless to do it the way it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, because change is inevitable and the world is very dynamic now. Therefore, a strategic leader should be able to adapt, to remain competitive in a changing social, economic, and technological climate that we are in at the moment. Therefore, strategic leadership provides a framework for a national security strategy. This is very important. This national security strategy should be able to meet the demands, the needs, and aspirations of the current trends. If we are going to stick on this is how we did it, this is how we'll do it, this is how we're going to do it in the years to come, then as a strategic leader, you are lost. It also provides an opportunity to ensure state and citizen-centric security, which should be addressed accordingly without compromise to security. I remember the first time I heard the word security, it was all about guns, bombs, and bullets. We never looked at the human-centric security, which is very, very critical. And if it's left unaddressed, you can be armed to the teeth, the armory, the air power, and whatever else you have. As long as you haven't addressed the human security, those are useless because there's going to be decimation of people in your country without firing a single bullet. And now, a strategic leader should ensure that there is a national security strategy. And I would just like to urge you to find out or to look back from the country you are coming, do you have a national security strategy? If you don't have a national security strategy, then the security leadership is compromised. Therefore, it is very, very important for strategic leaders to develop a national security strategy, which is going to be all encompassing. All encompassing in the sense that it's going to address both state-centric or hegemonic, as well as human-centered security. Unless that is done, the security will be like a two-legged pot instead of three-legged pot. It will be imbalanced. And this strategic the national security strategy should have a very, very formidable and strong 
budgetary allocation because all these issues and rather both these issues to cover state centric and human centric security will require money it will require resources both monetary as well as human resources and security being a prerequisite for any sustainable development uh, without a national security strategy development will not take place it will seemingly take place but it will not achieve the intended goals because there is no direction. It is therefore imperative for strategic leadership to identify security threats, both locally and around the nation where they come from, and then align them with appropriate intervention to prevent catastrophic situations. Like I said earlier on, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail as a strategic leader. Therefore, strategy is vital for successful outcomes. Now let's look at the role of strategic leadership. The role of strategic leadership is in ensuring security is to be sensitive to global security risks and threats prevailing at any given time. Therefore, a security leader should have his ears to the ground. And I don't mean himself personally, but should have people in strategic places who will keep him posted of what's happening, what is prevailing globally at any time with regards to security risks and threats. Therefore, focused how they affect national security and you'll be able to impact the, uh, rather to mitigate the impact of those threats so that a security leader is not caught unawares. We are hearing stories of floods here and there. A security or rather a strategic leader must be attentive and also foresee and plan on how such things are going to be addressed. We're hearing of drought, food security is affected. What are we going to do as strategic leaders to ensure that no one goes hungry? So focused how these threats affect national security and mitigate the impact well before this threat happens. Such leadership recognizes that in an interconnected world, the best way to secure our own interest is to understand and help secure the interest of others through collaboration. So there is need for collaboration at national and regional, as well as global level, we have to, co to collaborate because we are not an island. We are interrelated and interconnected. That is what a, secure, a strategic leader should be able to do. Because instability anywhere is instability everywhere. You cannot say, well, here in Zambia, we are independent and we are covered, we are food secure and stuff like that. As long as your neighbor, is hungry, they are going to look for food from anywhere, including your nation, which is food secure. So instability anywhere is instability everywhere. We have to make sure that our neighbors are food secure, uh, environmentally secure, and all those other elements of human security are addressed. And then hegemonically too, we have to ensure that they are well, well covered. I want to give you an example of our first president, the Zambian president, Dr. Kenneth David Kaunda. May he so rest in peace. That man was a strategic leader who inspired peace in the sub-region, the southern sub-region, as well as Africa as a whole. He sacrificed by supporting liberation wars and hosting refugees in Zambia. And whilst he was hosting, we were hosting these refugees in Zambia, we had to die a little. We had to share everything that we had with the refugees that were running into our country from Namibia, from Angola, from Mozambique, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, and some even from Somalia. They were coming in Zambia. We had to host them. We didn't send them away. Our president just said, Insecurity everywhere is insecurity here. Stability everywhere is 
stability here. So he stood on those principles. Next slide, please. A strategic leader forms international strategic alliances to collaborate on relevant security issues of common interest, such as climate change and its effect on human security. One leader may say, well, in my country, we've done this, we've done that, we have no emissions. You cannot restrict emissions in one country. Therefore, everyone must run the same race to handle all these catastrophic or climatic changes that are taking place. A strategic leader should look into these issues to ensure that there is uniformity in the way that one security threat is addressed. Otherwise, if it's only addressed by one person, it's not, it's not going to cut. So alliances should be achieved through combining resources, capabilities, and core competencies to address critical security concerns through regional economic communities like uh, SADIC and um, all those in the Sahel region. These must play a very big role in ensuring that Africans become very strategic as leaders to ensure all these elements of human insecurity, even hegemonic security are addressed. We'll look at the regional economic um, communities. The formation of the RECs has facilitated the following, a wider African integration at regional and continental level, which is very good, the RECs are increasingly involved in coordinating African Union member states' interests in wider areas such as peace and security, development and governance. For instance, SADC has certain objectives and the objectives are as follows, to achieve development, peace and security, and economic growth, to elevate poverty, enhance the standard and quality of life of the peoples of Southern Africa, and support the socially disadvantaged regional integration, as well as development of social and human capital involvement. There's also peace and security. These are very necessary prerequisites for sustainable development and deeper regional integration. Right now, there is a SADIC standby force or SADIC standby brigade, which was established by SADIC heads of state and governments through a memorandum of understanding which was signed here in Lusaka in 2007, August. So these MOUs that were signed included, included the SADIC standby force whose objective is, it is one of the building blocks of the ASF. This is a continental peacekeeping force established by the African Union and comprising military, police and civilian components that are on standby in their regions, all the regions in Africa, the regions of origin and are available to the OU for any intervention. And this is like a quick response right here in Africa. Let's have these capabilities built and move in as quickly as possible to prevent any catastrophic outcomes. There is the SADIC standby force, next comprising of poly, I mean, for members from various countries. Therefore, leadership can be benevolent and malevolent. And I'm going to give you an example of Lee Kuan Yew. He was the first prime minister of Singapore, and he can be cited as an example of a successful benevolent leadership. He lifted his country from poverty and relative obscurity to the social and economic success story Singapore is today. It's a nation to reckon with. It has developed so much. That didn't happen overnight and from nowhere. Abracadabra, boom. There was a strategic leader behind the success of Singapore. That's what strategic leadership can do. Hitler, on the other hand, was very successful in rallying his countrymen towards a common vision and a deep sense of nation pride and belonging. But leadership ultimately led to the 
World War II and the mistreatment and massacre of minorities in Germany. From these two examples, we can see that there is a relationship between leadership on the one hand and peace and socioeconomic well-being on the other hand. Those are the references I got all these um, issues from. But I also want to remember our fallen heroes like Mandela. He was a strategic leader. Uhuru Kenyatta, they were strategic leaders. And there are so many other African leaders that we've had. But then when it comes to a military leader, a military leader has to ensure that he is properly, not just properly trained, but also properly groomed. Otherwise, if they are going to be in a straight jacket of just looking at state-centric security, that strategic, so-called strategic leader will fail. And here ends my presentation and thank you for listening.